Children can go ahead and be dismissed to Children's Church if you haven't headed that way. This morning we're going to begin in Ephesians chapter 4. Before we dive into that text, though, I do want to say sometimes from time to time people will ask, how can I encourage pastors? And there's a lot of great ways. Let me tell you one way you can do it is by singing God's truth together. And I hear song after song, voices lift up, and I get more and more excited for the time that we get to come and look at God's word and behold his glory here. I appreciate your singing. As we've looked at, at core values, we've used several words. I've used several words to frame our discussion, starting with the fact that we're formed by, we're rooted in the gospel. We're gathered together because we believe what we just demonstrated by saying Jesus gave his body and his blood for us. We're gathered together because we believe we can come and partake in that, not because of our righteousness, but because of his. We delight in God's word because that's where we see the glory of God revealed in his gospel. That's where we learn all the things that he has for us. It's found in his word. Last week, we looked at Revelation 4 and 5, and we said that our goal is worship. That's where your race will end, is around the throne of Christ. That's where we're headed. And so today, what I want to do is look at our relationship with one another. You can summarize it as community. We could talk for months and months about our relationship with one another. Some of you, I know, have done this study. You've gone through your New Testament and said, where all does it say one another and said what does it tell you to do love one another welcome one another bear one another's burdens galatians 6 says serve in the strength that god supplies for one another to edify one another first peter 4 says we could go a lot of directions this morning i want to focus on one specific element of community and that is the necessity of community why we need it why it's not an optional thing that we could tack onto our core values and say, I've got the gospel, I've got the word, I've got God, I don't really need other people. And so we're going to look at two different passages. Ephesians 4 will be the first one. As we do, I want you to think all of these core values really operate on, on there's kind of a superficial way that you could claim to be rooted in the gospel. I think we'd all know that. You could have a head knowledge. Here's the truth of the gospel. But is that really what you believe? Do you really rely on it? Do you really stake your life on it? We can say we're people of the Bible. And I'm stepping on my own toes a little when I do this too. We can say we're people of the Bible, but we all know days when we get up and go, I don't want to read it. (laughs) We can say worship, that's great, while we're so easily acknowledging God's worth in a theoretical sense, and panicked with worry because something else might be taken away from us. See, There's two levels. In the same way, community, the mere fact that you're here and can look around and see other people doesn't necessarily mean that you are really interacting in community. Mere presence doesn't equal community. And as we go through these two texts, I hope you'll see why it's important that we have more than just we gathered in the same geographical location and then left. Before we read this text, because we always need God's help, let's ask for his help in prayer. Sovereign God, you have called us out of darkness into your wonderful light for a purpose. You've called us to proclaim your excellencies. I pray this morning that you would guard our souls by showing us your glory through these truths, by showing us your design for your people, by showing us the way you are pleased and delighted to work through each of us. Accomplish your purposes. You promised your word will go forward powerfully. So we depend on that. In Christ's name, amen. Ephesians 4, I'll begin reading in verse 11. Paul says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, 
until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful scheme. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. As we look at community, I'd like you to think of the way we use medical treatments or nutrition. The times that we would use those, I think of two main times, and you might think of others. I think of two. I think of children. We think we look out for their nutrition. Sometimes parents were a little more concerned and careful about their nutrition than ours, right? Why? Because we want them to mature and grow, to be what they should be. We wouldn't want them to be deprived of either a normally functioning body when we could give them a medical treatment that would help them. We wouldn't want them to be deprived of good nutrition so that they wouldn't grow correctly. And I think of times when you have someone who is either dealing with a significant illness or someone who is at least aware of the possibility of that illness, maybe in their family history, and they're starting to get to a point where they think, I've really got to be careful. We use medical treatments and nutrition for at least two goals, protection from danger and maturity. From these two passages, I want to encourage you to think God intends for your spiritual relationships with other believers, not only, but primarily, in the body of believers you gather with on a regular basis, for both your maturity and your protection. This morning, I want to spend most of our time, hopefully in the nicest way possible, pushing your nose into this text. It's not about my ideas, it's not about, at the, for today, every detail we could get out of this text. It's why did Paul, and God through Paul, write those verses so that we as Berean Bible Church would hear them. First, beginning in verse 11, the broad picture is God gives people to the church for a purpose. Verse 12 tells you that purpose, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of of Christ. Notice, it's not God gives apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers, so that they can do all the work of building up the body of Christ. That's not what the text says. The text says God's given people to equip the saints, and if you wonder who the saints are, go look at the beginning of most of the epistles in the New Testament. You're going to see, Ephesians is no exception, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, to the set-apart ones, to God's people who are there, who are faithful in Christ Jesus. God gives people to the church, and praise God for that. He doesn't give one person or five people or ten people to the church so they can do all the work of building one another up. God gives these gifts to the church so that they can equip every one of you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're here attending Berean Bible Church, to minister to one another. That's God's purpose. And if you say, I just don't really know how to do that, I got news for you. The people who stand up here and preach don't know how to do it all either. <laughs> The elders don't know how to do it all either. That's why we ask you to pray for our elders retreat. Because we need God's wisdom. If you feel like, I just don't know enough to do that. Well, hopefully by the end of today, I'll encourage you at least some things you can do. That every one of you can do. But let's continue on. Who needs this building up? Or this kind of community? Notice verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Every believer 
needs others building them up. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for three days or 300 or 3 million. I didn't do the math on that. That's probably longer than any of us have been alive. But the point is, we all need this. Who needs it? Everyone who's not mature. So you might think, well, I know some people, we wouldn't say it about ourselves. I know some people who seem like mature Christian. Okay, but the standard for maturity, according to this passage, is the end of verse 13, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we're all out. (laughs) Nobody's there. All of us need these kinds of relationships. The goal is maturity. You might think, all right, what kind of maturity? Because we have different kinds. We know he's not talking about physical maturity like we would with a child. You might think maybe it's ethical maturity. Like maybe that's the goal because we all know we fall short of loving our neighbor as ourselves like we should. If you're married, you know there are times you fail to love your spouse like you should. So we all know there's some ethical things, things we do or don't do. And you may say, well, it's that kind of maturity. That is part of it, no doubt. But I want to point you to the fact that it's more than that in this passage because he continues in verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. In other words, he's not just coming to say, you need to help one another so that you'll love others better. That's true. That's not all he's saying. He's saying there are doctrinal waves, winds that push against you. Some of them, he says, by human cunning. If you go look online enough, you will find people teaching some doctrine that's contrary to God's word, and they're doing it in very slick ways. You'll find that. And you might find... I don't know of this. Maybe it's because I'm new, but I, I don't know of this. You might find some people in this room who wonder if that guy's telling the truth or not. And they're in danger of being blown by a doctrinal wind. Part of what God wants you to do is to guard your brother and sister, to help them and build them up not only in what they do, but in their understanding of the truth, that's all doctrine means, teaching, in their understanding of the truth. And that is not only the job of people up here. This is for everyone who's a believer in Christ, to build one another up. Now, perhaps you hear that and you think, I've known some people who thought they were the doctrinal guard dog for everyone else, and it it wasn't really pretty. Thankfully, God knew about those people too. So he wrote more in this text. Verse 15, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. That means that when you are doctrinally trying to help your brother or sister, Love remains a part of that conversation. For a couple reasons. One being, you might be wrong. Now, if you're teaching Scripture and you know that's what Scripture says, of course, we can rest on that. But if I go back and I find, I have occasionally gone back and looked at sermons I preached when I was in college. And I know some of you have preached that long ago, and you might cringe at a few things you find happens because the picture in Ephesians 4 is not here's the person who's got it all figured out up on the stage and here are the people who learn but we work together to build up the body of Christ for maturity because none of us are as mature as the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and so we all work towards that But we do look forward to the verse I quoted when I prayed from Jesus paid it all. And when before your throne, I stand in him complete. One day that will not be the case. But right now, the case is we are all trying to learn and grow in maturity and trying to help one another. We don't do this doctrinally by like a, 
my way or the highway kind of doctrinal instruction. We speak the truth in love. We point to the text. We say, what does it say? How should we understand it? If I were to summarize Ephesians 4, and we are going to fly through both of these passages, we could dive a lot deeper. A flight. He's telling you that your relational interaction, including speaking the truth in love to one another, relational interaction is necessary for individual and corporate, our body, maturity. And it is the responsibility of every member of the body. Relational interaction, I'll say it again, including speaking truth in love to one another, is necessary for individual and corporate maturity and is the responsibility of every member of the body. Now, if you're carefully reading the text, you might say, I don't see the word necessary in there. That's a fair point. He doesn't say the word necessary. But I would say this, this is God's design that he describes here. This is what he promises to work. If I can use the medical analogy, it would be possible for a child who maybe had a bad hip. Their body would adapt to some degree. They would adjust. They might end up walking with a limp. But yes, their body would grow. There's a sense in which they would reach a certain sense of maturity. True. So we could say, well, is it necessary for them to have a good hip to grow to maturity? Not in one sense, but we would all know something's wrong. Right? We would look at it and say, that's not the way it's supposed to be because the way we're supposed to grow to maturity is with healthy joints. I know some of you on the other end of life are like, I wish I had some of those healthy joints back. And as much as we, we grieve that when someone's older and those difficulties I think we would all say if we saw someone hobbling around who was eight years old with a bad hip, we would feel differently about it. So is it strictly necessary? Can God grow someone to maturity without those relationships? God can do what he wants to do. God can bring words to Elijah. He can feed him with birds. God can do what he wants to do. But the means God has said in Ephesians 4 for reaching maturity the normal healthy means or that part of that are these kinds of relationships speaking the truth in love to one another now if you'll turn over with me to hebrews 3 hebrews 3 is going to continue talking about spiritual community it's going to talk about your responsibility and my responsibility in our relationships. But here, the emphasis is not so much on growing to maturity. Ephesians 4 was, we're going to grow to maturity, we're going to edify one another. Here, it's the other use of medical treatment, if you will. It's protection from danger. I'm going to read three verses. I'd like you to listen for three commands. Verse 12, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. First command, first two words. Take care. He gives this command, says this needs to be intentional. If someone takes care, we wouldn't say, well, they accidentally did it. There's an intent here. Take care. There's a considered nature, right? It, it's, it's you've thought about something, and now you're going to act on it. It's a measured action. If, if I were to tell you something like, if, if you're here as a married person and I were to tell you, take care to cultivate your marriage relationship. Well, we know what that means. That means I can't just let it accidentally happen. 
a vague idea like I need to love my spouse more may well be helpful, but it's not really taking care. Take care, he's telling you, you need an intentional, considered, not a vague idea, action. Okay, well, who is this command to? Take care, brothers, he says. As we, looking through Hebrews, if, you've, if you're familiar with the book, you know there's some challenging passages. A lot of them do relate to, well, who's he talking to? Here, for our purposes today, just notice he describes them as brothers. So at the very least, he is talking about professing believers. At the very least. In other words, this command, you shouldn't paraphrase it in your head to say, take care, brothers, lest there be in the drug addict who lives in the bad section of town an evil, unbelieving heart. He's not addressing that. He's addressing, unless that guy's here professing faith in Christ, and then maybe. Right? This is not take care how you relate to people out there. This is take care brothers. At the very least, professing believers who are there to hear this read. Take care brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. So why, why should you take care? He hasn't given you the treatment yet. He's giving you the danger. Take care because there's this disease. There's an evil, unbelieving heart. Notice, again, he's not talking about external actions. It's not take care lest some of you do things that look sinful. Although that will come from evil, unbelieving hearts. But it's internal. Take care lest there be in you an evil, unbelieving heart it's interesting i remember one time when we were down in florida i remember one of my kids praying and i don't remember which one praying about the at the time like 92 year old founding pastor of our church great godly man and my kid prayed help pastor limp to keep trusting jesus and that's a great prayer for Pastor Lemp. That's not just a great prayer for somebody who just got saved last week. That's part of what he's pointing you to here. Take care. Because salvation is so important, because Jesus is so worthy, take care. Lest there be in any of you the kind of heart that would turn away from God. We need to support one another so that no matter how long you've been a Christian, we are here helping one another continue to run the race. To keep trusting Jesus. I hope you pray that way. When you pray for the elders retreat, I hope you pray that way for us. When you pray for people in our body or in your life who are facing just incredibly difficult times, and you pray for George Waller. Pray for his healing. Pray for his comfort. Pray that he continues to cling to Jesus. Take care. There is the possibility, based on this text, that someone could hear this command and at the least profess to be a believer. They seem like they're on the inside. And yet there's a danger an evil, unbelieving heart that would fall away from the living God. So what's his treatment? Second command, verse 13. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. This is the prescribed medicine, if you will. I know this term uh, is controversial, so don't take it to that. But it's the vaccine that will help you say what did God say what does God want you to have in your heart and in your life so that you won't have the kind of heart that tends to turn away from him he wants you to have a community of people who exhort you exhort's not a real common word either so what is that the simplest definition I think is to say it's a promise mixed with a warning 
It includes both. If you were to look at the end of Hebrews in chapter 13, he describes this whole book as an exhortation, which is interesting because it has some of the sternest warnings in the whole New Testament and some of the most beautiful promises. We read, Christ is able to save to the uttermost those who come to him. We read, he's a faithful high priest who has been tempted like we are. We read, it pleased God to let him bring many sons to glory. We read, come boldly before the throne of grace. Promise after promise after promise. Yet we also hear, exhort one another every day that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We hear promises, we hear warnings. One biblical example of this, you remember when Paul was on the ship, headed over to Rome eventually, and as he's going across, God promises him, he tells him there's this storm, there's this shipwreck, God promises him, every person in this boat will be saved. All of those people. Then you remember the storm comes and a couple of them are like, I'm out of here. You have to think, if you think in modern terms, they're lowering the lifeboat. Right? They're, they're getting in. And Paul goes to their captain and he tells them, unless these men stay in the boat, they cannot be saved. Now, God had already promised to save by number that number of people. God was going to save them. He's promised that. But Paul gives a warning at the same time. There's an exhortation there. There's a promise and a warning. Why does he give the warning? To keep them in the boat. That's why the warning is there. As we come to this passage, we need an exhortation. We need a reminder, a promise of the beautiful things we have in Jesus. We also need a warning that if you trust in anything other than Jesus, there is no salvation available anywhere else. We need both. We need the promise, the salvation we have, as he said at the beginning of chapter 2, is such a great salvation. But notice the way he words it. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? He has both promise, it's a great salvation, and warning, if you go anywhere else, there's no salvation there. That's what exhort means. So when he says exhort one another every day, remind one another that we have such a great salvation and remind one another that nothing else can do that for you. Like we did with Ephesians, let's ask a couple questions of the text. Who needs this exhortation? All of us. Everyone who professes the name of Christ, exhort one another every day. From verse 12, lest there be in any of you. He doesn't say, exhort one another, lest the people who look like they're in trouble have this problem. In any of you, we all need this exhortation from one another. Who should be giving this exhortation? If you haven't caught the pattern yet, it's going to be the same answer. Everyone. He doesn't say, let's have some specially mature teachers. They're going to do the exhorting. The rest of you sit back. Uh -huh. He says, all of you exhort one another every day as long as it is called today, which leads us to when should we do it? Is it today? Then do it. And tomorrow you can ask the same question. It'll be the same answer. When should we do it? Every day, all the time. Don't worry about what happened in the past. You say, I haven't done this like I should. Okay. Is it today? Don't worry about tomorrow. I don't know what I'll get to do tomorrow. None of us do. Don't worry about that. He's referencing, if you read back, he's referencing specifically a quote from Psalms that looked back to Israel, and they're wondering, of course, but the way he's using it, he's saying, as long as it's today. Don't worry about the past, don't worry about the future on this particular issue, just exhort one another. Is it today? Then do it again. Every day, one of our responsibilities to one another is as we can, 
to exhort one another that Jesus is better or Jesus is worthy. Now, I know Jesus is better doesn't show up in this text either, but if you go back to the beginning of the book of Hebrews and start reading, what do you see? God spoke by the prophets, but now he's spoken in a better way. There were these angels, but now there's someone better than an angel. Here's humans. God's mindful of them, but there's one even better than those humans. That's Jesus who reigns. The beginning of chapter 3, here's Moses. He was good, but Jesus is better. Throughout the book, over and over and over and over and over again, he's going to name one thing after the next and tell you Jesus is better. That's what he exhorts you to. That's what we can do. You say, I don't know how to help people grow to maturity. Start there. Can you tell them Jesus is better? The beauty of that is you say, better than what? Everything. You don't have to get the right answer at the end of that. You can put anything there. Jesus is better. Exhort one another every day. Encourage one another again and again and again. Why do we need that? Think, we sang, is he worthy? We looked at Revelation 4. We're good for the rest of our lives, right? Oh, you know better. Why do we need it? He tells us that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Because there are things throughout your week over and over, distractions, which... To be distracted from the fact that Jesus is truly the ultimate greatest good is to be deceived. Let's not act like distractions and deception belong in completely different categories. They don't. Sin deceives us to say something else is better than Jesus. Always. You go back to the very first sin even before humans. Go back to that one. What does Satan do? God's not worthy of my worship. I'm going to exalt myself. Something else is better. Eve, that fruit's better than following God. There's something better. Over and over and over again, sin tries to deceive us to say, You will be missing out if you live your life as if Jesus is the best thing. You'll be missing something. Sin tries to deceive us over and over and over. And in our limited perspective, when we're overwhelmed, all been there, when we're overwhelmed by the trials that come that day, or when we're distracted by the joys that come, we're tempted to believe something else is better than Jesus. And that's why we need each other. In a real simple way, when you sing, is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? He is. That person next to you might not be feeling that today. And that's like the low bar, but that's exhorting one another. That's exhorting one another to say, Jesus is better. When you have conversations with people, What do you remind them of? We need the kind of community that comes alongside one another and over and over says, he's worthy of worship. He's better than if you're weak this week. Maybe you had a bad week. Some of you I know have. He's better than if your week had gone exactly like you wanted it to. We need one another to remind ourselves of this. I said earlier there were three commands. Verse 14, I should be, I'm going to clarify, it's not an explicit command. It's an implied command. Because he's going to tell you this is what health looks like. If we're guarding against danger, we say here's deceitfulness of sin that can distract you. What does health look like? It looks like consistent, continuing commitment 
to this confidence that Jesus is better because he gives us the greatest salvation and the greatest rest imaginable. For we have come to share in Christ. So the implied command is you need to hold fast if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. He doesn't state it as a command here, but it's an implied command. The verb tenses are really important here. If you get the verb tenses wrong, if you're like, I wasn't really into English, I wasn't either. It's kind of ironic now, but I wasn't into English. But the verb tenses matter because this isn't about verb tenses. It's about the reality they describe. And if you get these verb tenses wrong, you will end up with something other than gospel-centered Christianity. I'll show you what I mean. He says, for we have come, it has already happened, we have already come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. If you were to change that and say, for we will come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end, that would mean that you earn your participation in Christ by your holding fast to this confidence, which would mean you're not saved by gospel, you're saved by works. If he were to say, we will come in the future if we hold fast now, then you're not sharing in Christ yet, which means you're earning it. He doesn't say that. He's also not saying, we have come to share in Christ whether or not we hold our original confidence. We have to take both statements here. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Someone who continues to cling to Christ, that 92-year-old pastor I mentioned, who's still alive, he's 93 now, as he continues to cling to Christ, those around us over and over say, I'm so grateful for the salvation God has given him. His clinging to Christ is a demonstration to us around him that this is real. That is genuine. The author of Hebrews is telling you, we need to exhort one another because our continuing to cling to Christ encourages us and demonstrates that we have really shared in him. If I take that and connect it to community, he is saying that you and I have the responsibility through our exhortation for one another. We have a vital role to play in helping each other continue to cling to Christ and so demonstrate that we have come to share him already. That's the seriousness of what you're called to. This is not, I happen to get with a person that I like, and every once in a while we talk about some stuff that's kind of spiritually oriented, and if it happens, great, and if it doesn't, oh well. I, I don't know that this is the case here today, but statistically, I am completely sure this has happened in the life of Berean Bible Church. There have been people sitting here who have thought, I don't know if I even believe all that stuff. And again, statistically, some of them have gone out and not talked to anyone and turned from the faith. Also, some of them have talked to someone who they may not even be close friends with, but someone who just gave them that little push that said, Jesus is worthy. He's better. And God has used that to turn some people back to him. That happens here on Sunday morning, but it happens in some of your houses when people come over and visit you. It happens when you shoot a text to someone on a Tuesday morning to see how they're doing and you encourage them. It happens through your small groups and your Bible studies. It should happen, and it does. That's part of our responsibility. You've probably all been there. Maybe not that extreme, but the days you come in and say, I I don't know, is it worth coming and doing this again? And somebody says something to you that reminds you Jesus really is better. That's our responsibility to one another. That's what community should be. The point is not, if I can go back to Paul's promise and warning, the point isn't for us to read this text and be all, 
Like we're scared. Oh no, is that person about to fall away from Jesus? I don't know. No, the point is stay in the boat. Jesus is worthy. Encourage one another to stay in the boat. Look at your brother and sister and say, Jesus is worthy. This is worth living your life for. Sort one another daily. Briefly, I just want to make a couple practical comments. Because I hope your heart, like mine, is to say, I want to be used by God for those purposes, to mature people around me and to protect them from the deceitfulness of sin. I hope that's your desire. If so, I would say this kind of community is not merely friendship. If you meet with somebody repeatedly, maybe you talk with them a lot, and you can't remember the last time you talked with them about something related to God, I'm not saying that's a terrible relationship, but it's not this. If you meet with someone or you see them across the room and you say, we've talked a lot, I have no idea what to pray for them about. It's not really this. On the other hand, this kind of community isn't only about I walk up with you and I smack you with a Bible verse and then I walk away. We've all seen those kind of relationships. That's not what he's talking about either because you're not going to be able to come alongside and to use Ephesians language, really speak the truth in love if you don't build relationships with people. I'm not telling you all your relationships should be spiritually oriented in every conversation. It's okay to talk about volunteers football. But if every time you talk with a brother, you're talking about football and you can't remember the last time one of you encouraged each other to say Jesus truly is worthy, there's probably something, it, it's not this for sure, and I would say there's something wrong with that relationship as brother and sister. This kind of community, by the way, is not limited to people who have the same stage of life. In fact, that's one of the beauties of it, is that a 95-year-old can come alongside a 10-year-old and tell him Jesus is worthy not stage of life. It's not about we happen to have the same hobbies that might help sometimes. It's certainly not limited to somebody who has it all together in their lives because none of us do. It's not about I've got it figured out so I'm going to help you. I know some of you are runners. It's about when you run together and one person just whatever that day they're not feeling it. And the person next to them says come on we're going to keep running. That's what we do for one another as brothers and sisters. Come on, let's keep going. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So I would encourage you, it's not a program. It's not, I do these specific things. It's building relationships with people, worshiping God in your own heart and letting that flow out to them, exhorting one another every day to say, Jesus is worthy. We need that. It's not optional. The means God has said for maturity, community with one another, speaking the truth in love. The means God has said to protect us from the deceitfulness of sin, exhort one another daily, over and over. We need that kind of community that flows from worship. And praise God that he in his wisdom has chosen to use flawed and broken people to accomplish that in each other's lives. Let's pray. God, I do thank you for your grace, and I pray that we would be people who worship you wholeheartedly, that we'd be people who encourage one another, point one another in our interactions on Sunday mornings and in our interactions in other contexts. May we take seriously our responsibility to hold one another up, to encourage, exhort one another. We thank you that you, in your wisdom, you have chosen to display that wisdom through the church. We're weak. Many times we're foolish. But you show your strength through weakness. You have chosen to allow the foolishness of this world to confound the wise. Or do you do it all so that we could not claim any credit for ourselves, 
no righteousness, nothing that we can boast in except Christ and him crucified. So may we do that. May we boast in that truth in ourselves and to one another. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. To him be all glory and honor forever and ever. Amen.